Dear honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. For those who don't know me, I'm Panos Tafas. I'm the president of the Macedonian Society of Great Britain. Uh, it's really great to see you here, to see familiar faces and uh, new faces. Uh, and that's important for us because over the last two years, all, all, all of our events were online due to to the pandemic. So it's really nice to uh, have you here with us tonight here at the Hellenic Center. So before, before we start, let me say a few words about our society. The Macedonian Society of Great Britain was founded in London in 1989 uh, by members of the Greek community in the UK. It's a registered charity and a member society of the Hellenic Center. The primary aim of the society is the promotion of the Hellenic heritage of Macedonia. Our main source of funding is grants by various foundations and donations from the public. We are truly privileged to have the support of the AG Leventis Foundation for several years now, uh, who is also our main sponsor tonight. But as we all know, money cannot buy time. Uh, so I reach out to you and invite any of you that are interested and have a bit of time to spare to come and join us in order to help the, to help the society to continue to operate by organizing event, events that promote the Hellenic heritage and culture here in the UK and beyond. Today's event is dedicated to Byzantine Thessaloniki. And I'm really glad that we managed to put together a brilliant group of uh, really passionate people, uh, truly passionate uh, speakers, to talk about uh, Thessaloniki during the Byzantine era. Dr. Maria Xanthou is Senior Research Associate at the University of Bristol and Research Associate in Pindaric Studies at the Center for Hellenic Studies of, of Harvard University in Washington, D.C. She worked as junior research fellow in the social and cultural construction of emotions, the Creek Paradigm project in Oxford from 2009 to 2013. She taught classics, ancient, medieval, and Byzantine history at Aristotle University, Hellenic Open University, Open University of Cyprus, University of Bristol, and University of Leeds. In 2020, she was visiting visiting fellow at Seeger Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton University, and in 2015, she was residential fellow at uh, CHS at Harvard University. Throughout her academic career, she was awarded academic scholarships from Aristotle University Academic Excellence Scheme, Hellenic State Scholarships Foundation, and Nikos and Lydia Trichas Foundation for Education and European Culture. Dr. Anastasios Tantzis is an Associate Professor of Byzantine Archaeology at the School of History and Archaeology of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. He studied ar architecture, Byzantine archaeology, and he received his PhD on Byzantine church architecture in 2008. During 2005 to 2007, he was an international visiting scholar at the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, working with Robert uh, Austhurt. He teaches Byzantine archaeology, museology, architectural history, and architectural preservation, both on undergraduate and graduate level in the School of History and Archaeology at the School of Architecture at the Aristotle University. He authored Architectural Synthesis in Byzantium and Introduction in 2012, and several papers focusing on church architecture and issues of patronage and ideology. He has published on the monuments of Mistras and is currently preparing a book on his church architecture. Last but not, not least, Mr. Henry Hopwood Phillips works at Bismarck Analysis as a specialist in Eurasian uh, geopolitics, having worked in the media for most of his life including stints at TRT World and CCTV. He used COVID-19 to author a book on the topography of Constantinople, which is currently with a publisher. His proudest achievement is his imitation of uh, P.L. Fairmore's uh, Odyssey, 
when he, aged 19, walked from Athens to Constantinople armed with a dozen books on the Eastern Roman Empire. He tweets daily about Byzantium, uh, where, at Twitter obviously, where he's also no, known as Byzantine ambassador. So Henry uh, has kindly accepted to chair the session and lead the discussion in Q&A. So thank you, Henry. And without further ado, I give you our panelists. Um, first of all, I would like to begin by thanking our attendees, uh, Mr. John Karas and uh, Dr. Panos Dafas, uh, for their kind generosity. And of course, last but not least, I would like to uh, thank Henry Heput Phillips. Uh, well, in the past, in antiquity, uh, people used to meet uh, in the forum. I met Henry uh, in the digital forum of uh, Twitter, and uh, I'm very happy and glad for this. So thank you, Henry, for making this uh, happen. I also would like to thank my colleague, Professor Anastasio Stantis, who is an expert on Byzantine uh, archaeology, and he is going to tell you more uh, about monuments and the Byzantine archaeology in Thessalonica. Uh, today, I'm going to give you an overview about the history of Thessalonica, its cultural life. But first of all, let me go through uh, the monuments, the remnant, and their modern urban surroundings in order to understand the space. Thessalonica was founded uh, around 315 by King Cassander. And uh, what you see here is an inscribed base of a statue of Thessaloniki. It's uh, uh, dated on the second century BC. You can see it in the archaeological museum. And uh, Cassander, in a way, founded Thessaloniki uh, based on a conglomerate of small villages. So keep that in mind for later. This is an image I've selected from uh, an icon of St. Demetrius, it's uh, much later, uh, it's dated in the 16th century from the Byzantine uh, Museum of Antigunyotza and Corfu. And uh, here you can see, I picked it uh, especially because it represents Thessaloniki encircled by its walls. Here you see the modern urban plan of Thessalonica before its expansion eastwards and uh, westwards. And um, as you can see, it is surrounded by its old uh, walls. And uh, now the city has kept these uh, limits in the what we call the modern, the modern urban city center, but now it's much larger. Here, for example, you can see some uh, children strolling on the Byzantine uh, wall. And here it goes right down up to the port. Okay, somewhere over there is Rotunda. And over there is the Thermai Gulf. By the way, this uh, part of the port and further down here, it, it uh, was used by the British fleet during the First World War. Uh, here is the reconstruction of Galerius' palatial complex of Thessalonica. Uh, I picked these uh, uh, images in order to uh, give you an understanding how uh, the, to, well, to have an understanding how the, the uh, Roman city looked like and uh, uh, this massive construction project by Galerius, uh, whose parts uh, still survive. Although I know that my colleague Anastasios Tantzis disagrees, and he has every right to disagree with this reconstruction, uh, it is an efficient way for students uh, to understand how Byzantine, Roman and Byzantine Thessaloniki looked like. 
And by the way, this is also where the slaughter uh, of uh, Theodosius also took uh, place. So here is also a part of a rotunda, um, again, with the disclaimer, of course, that archaeologists uh, disagree with the reconstruction. And again, an overview of the hypodrome. Now, this is how Rotunda looks like right now with its modern surroundings. As you see, um, the buildings, the urban, modern urban, urban buildings are here. Here we have uh, one, the last surviving minaret of the Ottoman uh, period. And of course, here you see these massive uh, constructions, modern constructions surrounding uh, the place. And here are the walls up, uh, the Byzantine walls, which go to the what we call the upper city, the uh, old upper city. Now, let me give you some historical setting and milestones about what Thessaloniki was all about. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the Hellenistic and uh, Roman era. I'm going to focus exclusively uh, on the Byzantine uh, era. On 617, we have the first recorded siege of Thessalonica by Avars, which was a, a Turkish uh, tribe, and of Sklaveni, uh, probably a Slavic uh, uh, nation. Of course, the source of, uh, of this is the massive text of Miracles of St. Demetrius, which Henry will talk about uh, later. And here you can see uh, an example of the manuscript. Uh, again, in 676 until 678, we have a, another unsuccessful siege of Thessalonica by uh, Sklaveni, again documented in the Miracles of St. Demetrius. In the 9th century, during the so-called Byzantine Renaissance, St. Cyril and St. Methodius, the two Byzantine Christian theologian, uh, theologian missionaries, uh, devised the Glagolitic alphabet. Uh, they were linked with Patriarch Photius. They, sent, they were sent to various missions to the, uh, to the Slavs, first to the Hazards and ultimately to Great Moravia. And also they compiled or wrote the first Slavic civic uh, code. And I have placed uh, the, the Bashka tablet, which is an early example of Glagolitic uh, script uh, in, found in Croatia. And here is also a miniature by uh, a Slavic, uh, uh, well, a, a manuscript written in a Slavic uh, script. As you know, the uh, Byzantines were very effective. Uh, when they didn't want to make war, they tried you know, to take some nations, to Christianize some nations as a, a way to bring them towards their side. Another big event was the sack of Thessalonica, which took place in 904 AD by the Abbasid Caliphate's navy, led by a renegade uh, we, who was called Leo of Tripoli, a, a Muslim convert. Uh, what's the source of this uh, sack? It, it was the, a story uh, written by John Kameniatis, and here, of course, we have again a miniature by the famous Madrid Skilitis uh, manuscript. The, um, as you see, the, the, these are the, um, the ships, in a way, uh, landing to the port of Thessaloniki. Uh, the next sack of Thessalonica was by the Normans uh, of the Kingdom of Sicily uh, because the Normans uh, tried to retaliate to the uh, Andronicos um, Komnenosis massacre of the Latins in Constantinople in April 11, uh, 100, uh, 1182. Uh, the sack was documented by the Archbishop of Thessalonica, Eustasius of Thessaloniki, a person of formidable erudition. Uh, he was also a philologist. He wrote many works, and I'm going to uh, uh, present uh, 
him to you later. In 1204, uh, the sack of uh, Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade led to the foundation of the Kingdom of Thessalonica, alias known as the Regnum of Thessalonica or Vasilion Tes Thessalonikis. And here you can see um, how, I mean, uh, the, the how long was extended i mean it was part of halkidiki some of uh, thessaly also of central uh, greece uh, the kingdom of thessalonica lasted between uh, 1224 and uh, until 1246 and um uh, Theodore uh, Cominos uh, Dukas acted as an emperor of Thessalonica. Uh, here you can see him uh, standing and also facing the figure of Theotokos. Here is the face of Theotokos. And uh, also Theodore and Saint Demetrius standing facing, holding a castle between them. Uh, in 1230, we have the defeat of Theodore Dukas uh, Komnenos at Klokotnica, and the Empire of Thessalonica becomes a vassal state of the Second Bulgarian Empire. Uh, the Empire of Nikia uh, survives, the, which was formed after the uh, 1204 and, and uh, survives until 1261. The um, Byzantines tried to retrieve Thessalonica during uh, uh, the empire of Nikea. And in 1342, 1350, we have the movement of the Zealots. Uh, this movement, although some people uh, understay, uh, understate it, it's, I think, one of the most important civic and civil movements, and in a way predates the Paris Commune. Uh, it was uh, established mainly through financial reasons. People wanted, uh, of course, a redistribution of land. They also wanted to confront the rich uh, people. So in a way, they tried to establish a republic. Uh, of course, it, this republic was short-lived, but anyway, it, it is a very good example how professional associations, and you can see that in Daphne's Papadatu, Papadatu's uh, article, Political Associations in the Late Byzantine Empire, the Zealots and Sailors of Thessalonica, how the professional associations played a crucial role uh, in the social and financial life of Thessalonica. And there are also, uh, I added three other works. The one is by Konstantinos Kotsiopoulos, Unfortunately, all of them are written in modern Greek, and a recent one published in 2021 by Panayotis Tsapogas. It is called The Movement of the Zealots in Thessalonica. Uh, I would like to single out uh, Professor Matsuka's uh, book, Zilotica, which is actually uh, a novel. Uh, Professor Matsukas, uh, who used to be professor of theology at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, wrote uh, a novel exactly set during uh, the movement of the zealots, where one can read it and see exactly how the movement was formed and how it affected people's uh, lives. Now, in 1354, we have the capture of Gallipoli by the Ottomans, which in a way uh, kicks off the Ottoman um, uh, expansion in the Balkans. Here you can see again a, a miniature from uh, an old uh, uh, manuscript of uh, the Ottoman, uh, uh, from Ottoman soldiers. And uh, in 13, between 1383 and 1387, uh, during Manuel Paleologos uh, rule of Thessalonica, who eventually became emperor and ruled between 1391 and 1425, the Ottoman Sultan uh, Murad I laid a lengthy siege against the city. 
Um, let me remind you that uh, Manuel II Palaiologos was the first and only Byzantine emperor to visit King Henry IV of England in London in December uh, for, uh, 1400. Here you can see Manuel Palaiologos and uh, Henry IV. And uh, the source is St. Alban's Chronicle. Uh, maybe Henry can correct me on that. I hope uh, I am uh, pointing towards the right uh, source. And in 387, we have the surrender of the Saloniki to the Ottomans. Uh, in 1391, John V Paleologos dies, and Thessalonica enjoys complete autonomy in exchange for payment of the famous Haraj Paul tax. In general, I would say the overall uh, estimate is that Thessaloniki was treated by the Ottomans rather more leniently uh, than the other uh, cities which were utterly destroyed. Uh, in 1391, we have the crowning of Manuel II of Paleologos, and in 1403, Thessalonica falls under full Ottoman control. However, Manuel II of Paleologos, after John Paleologos dies, escapes from Ottoman custody, returns to Constantinople in order to succeed his father. And of course, this makes Bayezid, here is Bayezid, as you can see him, uh, very angry and leads him to storm and capture Thessalonica after a brief resistance. Now Thessalonica, uh, during its submission to the Ottoman, is under full Ottoman rule, and the Christian population and the church population retains most of their possessions. And of course, the city retains its institutions. Uh, unfortunately, there is an, uh, a struggle between the Ottomans about who is going uh, to succeed uh, Bayezid. Uh, this uh, era is called Ottoman Interregnum. And Manuel II decides to side with Suleiman, which is Bayezid's the first eldest son, in, and secures the return of Thessalonica, part of its hinterland, the return of Halkidika Peninsula, and of course the coastal region between Strimon and Thrace and Pineos, which is uh, a river in Thessaly. And uh, we, actually this zone is the most fertile plain in uh, the whole uh, Greece. Uh, in uh, 1403 uh, until 1408, uh, Thessalonica is entrusted to John the Seventh uh, Paleologos, and John Paleologos governs the city. Uh, between 1408 and 1423, uh, Thessaloniki changes hands, and uh, the despot Andronikos Paleologos uh, governs Thessalonica. In the meanwhile, uh, it experiences several attacks by Ottoman pretenders. As I told you, we are in the era of the Ottoman Interregnum, for example, from Musa Jelebi in 1412 and Mustafa Jelebi in 1416. However, the city endures uh, these attacks. Um, Adronikos Palologos, unfortunately, makes what we may call the killer mistake. Uh, he entrusts the city or transfers the city administration to the Venetians. And uh, the local uh, population expects the Venetians to roll out an effective defensive plan for Thessalonica. Unfortunately, the Venetians were not as a, 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 as effective as expected. And uh, the city on 29th of March 1430 uh, falls in the hands of Murat II. Uh, and we, how we know this? Because this sack, the last one, the complete one, is documented by an otherwise unknown person, John Anagnostis, who was a very meticulous historian because he gives us very important uh, information about why and how the city fell to the Ottomans. I would like to draw your 
uh, attention to this inscription. This inscription is uh, on the columns of Achiropito's church in the city center of Thessaloniki. Uh, it is written, of course, in the Ottoman script, and uh, here you can see the, uh, the translation, like Fetihi uh, Sultan Murad Khan Sehri Selanik Sene, and it refers to uh, the Ottoman, the, the, the Arab chronology, 833, which corresponds to 1430 AD. Ahiropito's church was, um, uh, in a way, uh, Murat turned it into a jami, the Eskijuma jami. However, uh, people who know about Ottoman scripts inform me that probably from the way the letters are written, this must be a much later addition. Now, in uh, 1403 and 1423, Thessalonica experienced a period of relative peace and prosperity. As, and as I mentioned earlier, after 1413, the Ottoman pressure on Thessalonica grew. Uh, in 423, uh, the growing Ottoman pressure on Thessalonica led despot Andronikos Paleologos to cede the city to the Republic of Venice. And, but unfortunately, this uh, led to the, uh, to the conquest of the city by the Ottomans because the Venetians fell uh, short of both Andronikos Paleologos and the population's expectation. Now, let me introduce you to some important homines literati uh, in terms of cultural life of Thessalonica. First of all, we have Leo the Mathematician, a famous uh, philosopher, and uh, perhaps he was one of the first uh, humanists. He, um, uh, he was the person who introduced algebra in uh, the Hellenic world, and uh, he, his main his focus point was philosophy. We, of course, we have the three uh, formidable philologists. We have Eustathius of uh, the Archbishop of Thessalonica, the Thomas uh, the Magister, Demetrius Triclinius, and of course we have the th uh, famous theologians Gregory Palamas, who, who was the head of uh, Hesychas, and Nicholas uh, Kavaslas, another uh, mystic theologian who, in a way, um, was the um, against Gregory Palamas, and we have two major people uh, who wrote and compiled uh, legal texts and uh, codes. One of them is Matthew Blastaris, and the other is Constantine Harmen, uh, Harmenopoulos. Harmenopoulos is very famous because he compiled a six-book uh, abbreviation of the Justinian law and the, and the civic law. This law was used during the Ottoman rule and also uh, Constantine Harmenopoulos' six hexabiblon, this is uh, the title of his work, was used by the liberated uh, Greek uh, state after, of course, 1830, uh, for, in order, you know, to be used uh, as a law uh, and as a free state. Um, here, again, we have, as you see, I have singled out the focus points of uh, these uh, unique uh, people. And, of course, we have other important persons who either stayed in Thessaloniki briefly or, in a way, they were intermingled with its cultural life. We have Theodore of Studion, uh, who was a supporter of... Uh, uh, he was an uh, iconophile. He was uh, uh, entangled in the uh, eco in iconoclasm, and he stayed... In, he was exiled in Thessaloniki in 18th century AD. I have uh, added here the famous icon, which is kept in British Museum. 
which is it, it is it is dated much later around 14th century and uh, it is kept in the in the British Museum and here you can see Theodore Studitis holding an icon of uh, of Christ if you go to the British Museum you might be able to to see it and of course a farmer's law or or leges rustice were drawn up by Justinian II in Thessalonica in autumn 688 AD. Uh, some uh, information about Leo the mathematician. He was a representative of 9th century humanism. He was a student of Michael Psellos. He was collector of manuscripts. He introduced algebra in the Hellenic world. According to Paul Lemel, he was uh, the first European humanist. And of course, he was a teacher of Kirill and Methodius. Eustathius of Thessalonica, again, a person of formidable erudition. He wrote commentaries on Homer's Iliad and Odysseus, who, which are still used here. You can see one of the manuscripts. A, a commentary on Pinda, commentary on Dionysius Perigitis, and orations. Uh, Thessaloniki during the 13th century turned into a study center of Greek uh, literature. We have people like John Pediasmos or Pediasimos, Thomas Magister, Dimitrius uh, Triclinius, who, comment, uh, who, uh, who commentated, edited tragic poets like Aristotle, uh, sorry, like Aeschylus, uh, Sophocles, Euripides, philosophers like Aristotle, Synesius, and also Thomas Magister produced an edition of Pindar with Scolia, with commentary. Dimitris Triclinius uh, acted as an editor and commentator of Greek uh, poets, while John Pediasmus wrote Scolian Hesiod, Theocritus, and Aristotle. And of course, we have in a way the overshadowing um, uh, presence of Gregory Palamas, who lived between 1296 and 1359. Gregory Palamas was a Byzantine theologian and an Eastern Orthodox cleric. He was the defender of Hesychast movement and spirituality. He served as a metropolitan of Thessalonica in 1347 onwards, and he was the teacher and supporter of what we know as mental prayer, or alias known as the prayer of the heart. In Greek, noera prosephi. Um, a less known event in uh, Gregory's, uh, in Gregory Palamas' life is that uh, he, uh, while he was trying, uh, while he was uh, traveling on a ship, he was abducted by pirates and was ultimately held, uh, ended up to um, uh, to Orhan, the the son of uh, Osman uh, Bey, the um, the person who founded the the Ottoman. Uh, Empire, the, the Ottoman family and the Ottoman Empire, and Orhan set up uh, a debate between Gregory and uh, some Muslim uh, uh, people in order to understand what uh, orthodoxy is all about. Um, now, after the Ottoman conquest or uh, somehow uh, uh, some years uh, before we have uh, two uh, intellectuals who originated from Thessalonica the one is Theodore Gaza or Theodore Gazis who was born in Thessalonica in 1398 and died in Calabria in southern Italy in 1475. And here you can see Theodorus Gaza depicted in Sandro Botticelli's The Adoration of Maggie. And I would like to conclude my presentation with another famous uh, person, which is uh, who is Andronikos Kallistos. Uh, the two uh, people were related. Uh, because Andronikos was a cousin of Theodore Gaza, who was born in Thessalonica, uh, traveled to Italy, of course, to escape uh, the Ottoman uh, rule, and ended up dying uh, in, Lo in London uh, in 1476. 
So this was my overall overview of Thessaloniki and historical setting, and thank you very much. I will pass on to my uh, next colleague. Hello, hello, hello. Um, I will just, uh, maybe a good bridge here is, uh, you mentioned Elton Palace, which I've got to say is probably London's sole Byzantine attraction that's outside a museum. Uh, it's gorgeous. It is where Henry IV um, met Manuel II. Um, there's not really much left other than the hall they met in, um, but there's a lot of gorgeous Art Deco stuff, riffing on Byzantine themes, lots of aesthetics like, you know, golden ground bathrooms and things like that. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's literally just outside London, so you're really being lazy if you're not going. Um, so, to get on with my talk, um, my talk is on Thessaloniki in a sea of slavs from 533 to 904. The speech will have two halves. Uh, the first, I'll be honest with you, is really just academic justification for being really annoyed with a German historian which some of you might know, some of you might not, is called Jakob Philipp Falmeier. Uh, now, he, he's quite famous for kind of casting the Hellenic genius in purely racial terms. Uh, the second half of the speech will be on seeing Thessaloniki as a, a key node in the survival of the Byzantine West, as in the European half of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, I mean, it did suffer four imperial expeditions in a course of just 120 years. Um, so let's start with Falmer. I mean, really I'm touching on him because for me, it gets to the nitty gritty, which is the what's, the how's, the why's and the when's of the Slavic occupation of pretty much the whole of the Balkans. And I say that in the sense that it kind of happens out of nowhere. Um, for me, it's quite interesting because I think you could pretty much say it's only two generations. Uh, you get Slavs going from not even mentioned to Slavs owning almost a third of an empire. Um, and I think Falmeier kind of said the quiet bit of the Western conscience out loud when he said, the Greeks were a bunch of Albanians, Slavs, and Turks. That is basically, Halasa, Greece is essentially an Ottoman dustbin rather than the pure font of the Renaissance imagination. Um, yes, Farmerai, if any of you know him, is the ultimate nemesis of the Phil Hellens. Um, he wrote in his History of the Maria in 1830 that not this, and I'm quoting, this is, these are not my words. Not the slightest drop of undiluted Hellenic blood flows in the veins of the Christian population of present day Greece. So what do we have here? We have not only were the Greeks not Orthodox, of course they're schismatics thanks to the great schism. They are not only not Roman, don't forget they're, they're Greeks, the Hellenes. They are also now in this, this endless cascade of demotions, um, essentially not even Greeks. So they, these are uh, imposters on every possible level. Um, now, you might think like me, that that's a little rich coming from a citizen of Germania, which has pretty much produced only men who have ended the Western Roman Empire, well, that's the fifth century. Then they pressed the filioque upon the Pope, a little bit later. They sacked Constantinople in 1204. They invented Protestantism in the 16th century. And then they promoted the racialization of nations in the 20th. But that's enough of my Twitter feed. It's time to get serious. Um, ultimately, Farmer could get away with this bunkum because there is a cloud of mystery that envelopes that obscure period in the Balkan history that stands roughly between the failed attempts of Justinian to conquer the West, well, reconquer the West, shall we say, a kind of reconquista, um, and essentially Justinian II's 
Vulcan campaign, which comes around 688. Um, thankfully, and I'm kind of trying to tie in Thessalonica here, is essentially one of the only accounts that actually provides any flesh on the bones of the Slav question is St. Demetrius's miracles, the miraculous thanks to Demetri in Latin, and that kind of fleshes stuff out. Um, let's go through some sources to begin with. Sorry, I don't have any beautiful slides. You have to listen to my gorgeous, merciless voice. Um, but essentially, I'm going to sift through some sources, and you'll just see how bare bones this stuff is, because then we actually get to Demetrius' miracles, and they're, they're a lifesaver. Um, so essentially, we first come across the Slavs um, as background fodder to Procopius and Jordanes. Um, they do provide some important details. One is the general Germanus, uh, Germanus intercepts some Slavs in 518. Um, that's pretty much the first thing we hear of them, 518. So kind of mental note there, 518. Uh, the Magister Militum in Thrace, uh, Halbudius, is actually fights the Slavs. He's known as super brave. Procopius bangs on about how brave he is. None of the valor of the Roman Empire can match uh, Halbudius because essentially he crossed the Dan Danube to go and take the, the fight to the Slavs. Uh, but he doesn't do so very, very long. He pretty much does some for three years and then he dies doing so. Uh, Menander the Guardsman's next. I mean, he actually puts down the Slavs. He just says they're a bunch of Avar lackeys. Um, which is kind of true, to be honest, but it kind of develops a lot more. John of, of Ephesus um, talks about Slavic raids in the mid-6th mid century. Actually, some of the most inform in interesting information comes from Western chroniclers, which you probably wouldn't think of. Um, John of Biclar is a, a Visigoth, of all people, and he provides some... I know he was in Constantinople, but he's also providing some super up-to-date information like Slavs ravaging uh, Illyricum in 576 and 581. Uh, he also occupies, the Slavs occupy parts of Greece in 579. Um, there's only two bits more of information. One's the Strategicon. Some of you might know it. Some people claim the Emperor Morris wrote it. Most people believe he commissioned it. They, they actually, that, that one's a, a little bit of an interesting text because it claims that the Slavs were a bit like the Indians and in that they practiced, uh, you know, Imperial Britain is again, these guys, well, their wives are dying whenever their husbands do in a kind of thuggy practice. Um, Isidore Seville is the last one. He basically says the whole of Greece is occupied. And I mean, Isidore dies in 636. So pretty much by the reign of Heraclius, we've got, we've gone from a few tepid, tiny little raindrop raids to Greece is gone. Um, now for English and by myself, it's quite interesting because this is a side note, I'm not gonna lie. There's a side note which is quite interesting for me because this guy's winning victories with names like Godwin. Now, Godwin's not a particularly Greek name. It's not even a Latin name. I mean, you can reach for like words like Amadeus if you want friend of God, which is just kind of cool in the cosmopolitan sense that you had, uh, he wasn't a general, but he was a fairly senior military official um, and he's achieving massive victories against the Slavs in 602. Um, the next thing we hear is from Fredegar. He's in the west of the Slavs, so think of Moravia, bordering on Germany. He's kind of ruling the Slavic Empire under the name Samo. Um, and Columbanus is thinking at the time, roughly 630, thinking, no, a bit earlier, a bit earlier. He's going, let's, let's convert these guys. He chickens out. One of his disciples, Amandus, does it. Um, which brings us to the miracles of St. Demetrius. Now, these are several books. Uh, the first one's actually written in 610, um, and Maria kind of mentioned one of the raids. Uh, well, it was a siege, actually, roughly 5,000 Slavs in 617. Um, essentially, book one boils down to uh, Demetrius is your guy. He's your saint. He's your patron. You know, um, I'm actually trying to think. Is there a... There's not really a, a Constantinopolitan equivalent, maybe, like, well, the Theotokos. The mother of God, basically, right? So th there's no real Demetrius of Constantinople, which I think is quite cool. Um, so essentially, there's a lot of flesh on the bones here. I'll cut to the chase. Essentially, Demetrius is always on a city wall um, defending this place. Um, and it's adding really interesting details, like um, the Slavic king, Pabundius, uh, 
basically managed to assimilate into becoming a, a Roman, both costume, he spoke Greek, um, and yet he he was kind of a Roman in the way the Bulgars later became Ro Roman in the sense that they just wanted to boss the Roman pie. They weren't actually, you know, he wasn't actually interested in the civilizational or Christian element. Uh, it was a kind of wig to control people under. Um, and so Demetrius is obviously like, not a big fan of Perundus, and there's a great big siege again in 677. Um, uh, an earthquake topples the walls at some point. I mean, D Demetrius is full of hijinks. Um, he, he's stopping the Slavs with ginormous fissions during battle. At one point, I mean, it gets a little bit silly. He's kind of, um, he's slapping a Slavic craftsman who's had the temerity to build this ginormous siege tower. Um, but it does provide historical knowledge. It's providing things like saying Thessalonica is surrounded by seven Slavic tribes and things like that, kind of stuff that is good as source material for historians. Um, but to, let's just loop back to Farmera. Basically, he didn't use all these good sources. He was just a bit lazy as a historian. Um, we've covered all the good evidence for Slavs overrunning parts of Greece. But the one he relied on is known as the Chronicle of Monavasia. And that, that's the one he bases all his theories on. And that's a bit sad for many reasons. Um, the main one is the only manuscript of this chronicle that contains the information he claims it does. It's just one of them, and it's the last one. It's actually in a monastery in uh, Athos called uh, Ivron, uh, the Georgian one. Uh, and basically, it's the last one to be written. It probably contains a lot of interpolation because um, the other ones use Alexandrian dating, which is an older form of dating to the Byzantine one. Essentially, you date them from different uh, years. One's 5509, the other one's 54 or something. I always forget which. Um, but basically, it's later. Um, and the Chronicle, on top of all that, is written in the late 10th century. So that's a long time from when the Slavs start attacking in 518. We're talking a Chronicle written almost five centuries Later, um, oh, and the final point is it was written as a religious text, a kind of backstory for the Metropolitan See of Patras. Uh, it, it, it's basically religious bunkum. Um, so to just conclude on Famraya, he may be right, he may be wrong, but don't lean on texts that are late and incorrect. You know, I'm kind of pleading the case here for doing good history, not the lazy Germanic sort. Uh, which leads me perfectly to segue onto part two of this, which is rescuing victory from the jaws of defeat, the Byzantine resurgence between 657 and 904. Now, according to Theophanes, Constans II, in looking to balance his poor military record against the Arabs, basically assaults the Slavs in the mid seventh century. Um, now, this is kind of interesting just because he doesn't really manage to drive the Slavs away. Um, he just kind of subjugates them to a kind of, at the very least, notional imperial authority. Um, about three decades later, Justinian II manages the same thing. If anything, he improves it by joining up the land routes. But, um, you mentioned that gorgeous valley, the most productive bit of the stream on. Uh, he basically connects all the communication routes to Constantinople again. Um, but the perennial dilemma here is essentially that both Romans and Bulgars to the north um, are strong minorities. Uh, Nassim Taleb uses a beautiful phrase, uh, intolerant minorities, um, which I think applies here because they basically won't leave the Slavs alone. Um, they want to boss the Slavs around because Slavs mean taxes. Um, and the Slavs are kind of like, where do we get any money from? And they go to... Lots of them turn to piracy, actually. Um, Imbros is, suffers a lot, so does Samothraki. I mean, lots of these places basically are denuded of both property, uh, goods, and people in slavery a lot of the time. There's even a historical raid on Crete in 623. Not many people know about that one. Um, and all of this just kind of chaos means Constantine V uh, is forced to go on a massive campaign in the mid 8th century. Um, then, finally, Irene sends a general and, again, reasserting hard power where soft power has failed. 
which leads me to the conclusion, which is why has Thessalonica been the focus of at least four major Byzantine uh, expeditions between 657 and 783? Seems to be, the long and short of it is that um, these military exertions are just, uh, I, I guess they're, against, they're going against the demographic grain. Um, you're just kind of reasserting yourself, but failing to cow them into submission for anything more than a single generation. Uh, basically, Romanization is going to be slow if you don't have that many Romans doing the Romanizing. Um, and none of that really changes until 810, when Nicephorus starts to kind of plug into that dynamic and he just engages in a load of uh, population exchanges to use the 20th century term. It's just basically shunting people left, right and center in the empire. Um, and it was very successful because I think Maria, you mentioned him, John uh, Caminiates was essentially um, the chronicler of the 904 siege and one of his biggest um, praises for this Byzantine policy was by 904, the Slavs were fighting for the Eastern Romans, not the other way around. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I would like to thank uh, first the organizers, the Macedonian Society and the Panos Dafas for uh, hosting me extremely uh, well in London. And thank you all for attending tonight. Thank to my, thanks to my colleagues for uh, the wonderful talks they have uh, presented. I'm going to talk about Thessaloniki in the 14th century. Thessaloniki is a very beautiful place, but always was second best somehow. You know, we talk about Constantinople as the queen city, and uh, Thessaloniki was the co-queen, Simvasilevusa. But actually, in the 14th century, there's this sense that Thessaloniki gains in importance. You know, Orestes Stafrali, who wrote a book on Thessaloniki and its history in the early 20th century, uh, he... Uh, wrote a book on Thessaloniki's history and then a book on Thessaloniki's history in the 14th century. So that means that there is a lot to say about Thessaloniki in the 14th century. But actually, although we know a lot, we know not everything. I'm going to focus on this church called Prophetis Elias. Here you've got a map of Thessaloniki's monuments, you know, the walls and all the other monuments inside the city. And this church I'm going to talk about, the Prophetis Elias, as we know it, we don't know the original dedication. Prophetis Elias, Prophetis Elias is a misnomer. It still occupies a very prominent place in uh, Thessaloniki's topography. This is uh, Agius Dimitrios, St. Dimitrios Church. This is the Roman Forum. And actually, when Ernest Brar redraw Thessaloniki after the Great Fire of 1917, he made this uh, gesture, the Aristotelus Street, which is now one of the most beautiful streets in Thessaloniki, and it would have ended up in Prophetis Elias uh, if it wasn't for the excavation that revealed the forum and cancelled the construction of Aristotelus uh, above the Roman Forum. But this means that it was a focus in the center of the city this prominent place. And actually, it is one of the most beautiful and uh, greatest, greatest in architectural terms of the late Byzantine churches, not just in Thessaloniki, but everywhere. I mean, it is uh, a beautiful church, much bigger and much more monumental than any other in Constantinople, in Mistras, in Arta, in all the places where there are late Byzantine monuments. So let's start from this, the fact that it is the most beautiful and the most monumental. So we like to connect it, we would like to connect it, I would like to connect it to imperial patronage. And that is the first thing that we have to, to seek when we seek its identity. 
It is called Prophetis Elias because when two Englishmen, Texier and Palan, came to Thessaloniki to study Byzantine architecture, uh, heard that it was called Seraili Jami, and thought that this Seraili meant Prophetis Elias. But actually it meant that it was the Jami because it was converted to a mosque. As you see here, it's Minare, now destroyed. Uh, it was connected to a palatial residence, a serai. And I'm thankful to one of my colleagues in the University of Thessaloniki who found a text describing Thessaloniki in the 16th century. And the commentator says that it was called Seraili Jami because there was the palace of the infidels, not the palace of the early Ottoman administration which means that somewhere near uh, Prophetis Elias Church, there was a late Byzantine palace. So that is the second thing to keep in mind, and that that's actually corresponds to the topography of the church. The problem, as I already said, is that we do not know its original dedication. So we will focus on some of its peculiarities and try to address the whereabouts of its uh, uh, probably imperial patron and also its dedication. The church, here you have the plan, here is the plan before its restoration. It shows that it is a monastic Catholicon and actually one that follows the architecture of the Catholica of Mount Athos. And not only it just follows, but it is an exact copy of the Catholica of Mount Athos, the main churches of the monasteries in Mount Athos. And no, not only that, it is the earliest Athonite Catholicon outside of Mount Athos that has survived. Probably it was the first instance of a, a, a Athonite type Catholicon outside of Mount Athos. So there is a strong connection also with Mount Athos behind this church that I would like also to explore. Here we have the Lavra Catholicon, the Catholicon of the Lavra Monastery, which is thought to be the earliest one. There is some debate about which one is the earliest, if it is the Iviron or if it is the great Lavra Catholicon. But I think you can see the similarity in the layout of the of the plan, and we'll talk about, about it a little bit later. And the Lava Catholicon is from the 10th century, as you probably know. Here again, a comparison between Prophetis Elias and the great Lavra Catholicon to show the similarity in the layout of the plan. And this is the Vatopedi Catholicon, also of the same type as you see here in its plan, and one of the late Byzantine, because Vatopedi is also 10th to 11th century, one of the late Byzantine Catholica of Mount Athos is the Hilandar Catholicon. Here you have the plan. Unfortunately, in this depiction with the apse on the left, it should be on the right, anyway. So what are the main... Uh, the main characteristics of an Athonite Catholic it has two huge apses, one to the north, the other to the south. It has a T instead of a small narthex. It is a special unit found in all the monastic Catholic of Mount Athos. Also, it has small chapels, domed chapels, and also an ambulatory encircling the western part of the church. And actually, this is the Catholicon of Kutulumus in, in Mount Athos, which I think is the closest example of uh, the type of architecture applied to Prophetis Elias in Thessaloniki. But enough with the Athonite connection, I think you get the picture. So, why an Athonite Catholicon in Thessaloniki? Because the rest of the Paleologan, this is a good question, because the rest of the Paleologan churches in Thessaloniki have nothing to do with Athonite 
architecture. These are the typical layouts of the late Byzantine, the major late Byzantine uh, churches in Thessaloniki. This is Agios Saint Padelaimon. We don't know the original dedication. This is uh, the so-called Saints Apostoli, actually the Catholicon of a monastery founded by Patriarch Nephon in Thessaloniki. This is Agia Ekaterini, Saint Catherine, also not uh, dedicated originally to Saint Catherine. And this is the Vlatadon Catholico, which is the only one we have its original dedication. So, it, it does not resemble any other of the churches in Thessaloniki. So its patron, Prophetes Elias' patron, uh, choose, chose that layout in order to say something. That is my feeling about explaining why he, he or she chose this layout. Another specific uh, special feature of Prophetes Elias is this VIP balcony it's very beautiful. Now it's a little bit uh, smaller, the opening, than its original form. This VIP balcony overlooking the Naos, a gallery above the Liti, which is very advantageous. In, if you stand there, you have a very good view of what is happening inside the church. This is a feature of Constantinopolitan architecture. We don't have any other late Byzantine church in Thessaloniki having a gallery like this, but we find, and this is my specialty, because I follow women and the way they sponsored architecture, and I think that we have Catholica, a monastery churches in Constantinople founded by women, sponsored by women, who used these galleries as a VIP balcony in order to have a good view of what was happening inside the church. This is the Pantepoptis Church, sponsored by Anna Dalassini. Uh, she was the mother of Alexius I Komnenos. This is the Catholico, the, actually the church complex of the Pantocrator Monastery, again in Constantinople, founded not by John II, but by his wife, Irini Komnini, from Hungary, in the early 12th century. All three churches share a gallery running along their west, western part, giving great views in all three churches. And uh, last but not least, uh, Theodora, uh, the wife of Michael VIII Paleologos in the late 13th century, refounded the monastery of Livos which already had a balcony, a very nice balcony overlooking the main naos in its old church. And another small church with a VIP balcony founded by Theodoros Tarhaniotis' widow. Uh, it is this small chapel, not very small, but small to the church, uh, comparing to the church it is attached to, with this very nice balcony overviewing the main church. So what do we get from this? That this was a female thing. And how we know that? We have this letter sent by uh, Athanasius the Patriarch to Andronicus the Second Paleologos. He sends a letter for a completely different reason. I'm not going to give you any more details, but at some point he complains the Patriarch about women going into these galleries in churches in Constantinople, and he's talking here specifically for Saint Sophia, for Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and he says that he objects to this thing, women going up to the galleries to attend the liturgy, because he says they don't go there out of piety, they go to show off and to exclude themselves from the rest of the uh, congregation, and also he says to put themselves above everyone else, and especially above the liturgy itself. So he's really angry about it. Can you get the picture? Yeah. But consider now that if a lady wants to do that, if she sponsors a church, a monastic church, she can do whatever she wants to. 
and do not be condemned by any patriarch who objects to that. So when we talk about Prophetis Elias, we have two very specific features. It is, I'm think, I think it is fairly, uh, we are fairly uh, certain to say that this is an imperial foundation first. Second, it has a connection to Mount Athos. And second, it has a connection to some lady. The perfect candidate is Anna of Savoy for constructing this church. So let me explain about Anna of Savoy or Anna Palaiologina, who was a very famous empress residing in Thessaloniki in the middle of the 14th century. In an uh, uh, act by her, uh, grandson, Manuel II Paleologos, we get a picture that she became a nun in a monastery that probably she founded, and she gave to this monastery in Thessaloniki, the monastery of St. Sanargiri, she donated a palatial residence called Avli to Sirgi. It was the palace of some guy who was called Sergi. And we know from the details of this act of Manuel II that this Sirgi, whose residence was donated by Anna of Savoy to the monastery of Anargiri, was actually a guy named Guy de Lusignan. He was half a Cypriot French, half Armenian. And he came to Thessaloniki at some point. He had a family there. He had a daughter called Isabel Lusignan, and she was married to the son of John Katakuzinos. I know I'm throwing you a lot of names here, but if you know some of the Byzantine history, probably you can follow. And all of these were actually uh, the political opponents of Anna of Savoy. That is the main thing to have in mind here. So Anna of Savoy confiscated this palatial residence of Guy de Lusignan in Thessaloniki and donated it to a monastery. Anna, although coming from uh, North Italy, actually she became Orthodox. We know that because her praise, her commemoration in the, what is called the Synodicon of Orthodoxy. It is a manuscript in Mount Athos in um, uh, the Protaton kept, uh, where are the commemorations of all the emperors and all the patriarchs and other people. Her commemoration is five lines and is amazing. They call her Saint Anagia, and she is praised because she was instrumental uh, in the uh, fight between the Hesychas and the anti Hesychas is a, a huge thing. I think that uh, Dr. Xanthu told us a lot about this uh, fight. But praised by the, Athon the Athonite monks because she was a champion of orthodoxy uh, with the same uh, commemoration that is uh, used for John Katakuzinos who, who's actually, who actually was her political adversary. So Anna was a saintly lady for the Athenites, and actually she was instrumental in establishing Gregory Palamas as Thessaloniki's metropolitan. Because as Dr. Xanthus said, Thessalonians didn't like the rich people, that is the zealot uh, uh, controversy, but in this category of rich people were also the, mon the monasteries of Mount Athos because they were huge landowners inside Thessaloniki and the people of Thessaloniki didn't like that. So they thought that Palamas, because he was an abbot of Great Lavra, as a metropolitan would be in favor of uh, uh, the privileges that the monasteries had in Thessaloniki. So they opposed to his establishment as a metropolitan, and only Anna, who was very uh, favorably viewed by Thessalonians, was able to establish him in Thessaloniki as metropolitan. And apparently, her role in that 
is somehow depicted in the fact that she chose to construct a church that resembles Athonite Catholica, and in this way establish a new era in the relationship between uh, Mount Athos and Thessaloniki. And actually, this, I think, comes out on the rest of the sources, that the relationship between Thessaloniki and Mount Athos begins favor favorably only after the establishment of Gregory of Palamas. And so monks came and went from Thessaloniki to Mount Athos and visited Anna. Here I have an expert from one of the manuscripts. Um, I don't remember the, ah, the Hiariu. I'm sorry, I have it there. From the uh, Acts of the Hiariu Monastery. Some uh, monks uh, went and visit, visited her in her God-guarded palace. When she was done, to discuss an important case. Uh, this important case has to do with some real estate problems that they had in Thessaloniki. But in 1361, Anna was already a nun. And this God-guarded palace, I think, is the palatial residence that she used while being a nun in the monastery of Anargiri. Actually, this palace, originally belonging to Sergi, to Guy de Lusignan, uh, probably was a very valuable possession because her daughter didn't forget his daughter, I'm sorry, his daughter, Isabel de Lusignan in Mistras, didn't forget about it. In the continuation of the act that I, show you, I showed you before of Manuel II, when Manuel, before going to Venice to free his father, went to Mistras to collect money for this expedition, uh, Isabel asked for her dowry back, because it was her dowry after all, this palatial residence in Thessaloniki, and Manuel had to give it back to her. So apparently it wasn't just a small house, it was something big that mattered to this lady in Mistras, although she was there, mattered uh, this valuable uh, real estate in Thessaloniki, so she asked for it back. So coming back to Prophetes Elias, a prominent place in the Ottoman sources called near the palace of the infidels, an important church, uh, judging by its uh, position and also by its uh, size and monumentality, close to a palatial residence, as we have seen. And when we say palatial residence, if you want to have a, a view of what it might be in late Byzantium, this is the Tekfur Sarai, one of the lesser palaces in Constantinople. So don't expect something very spectacular. It might be just a three uh, levels uh, uh, structure like this. So somewhere around there, but unfortunately not surviving today. And the two small details that probably reflect uh, that this theory has lots of grounds to it. First, there is a, um, a coin, you know, that is another thing about Anna of Savoy, she minted coins in Thessaloniki, and that is very important because the mint of Thessaloniki uh, ceased to operate until the 14th century. Uh, it ceased to operate around the 8th century or the 7th century, it's a huge debate, but for sure it uh, started working again in the 14th century, and there are coins of Anna of Savoy either alone or with her husband or with her son, but there are some coins where she is depicted alone, and these coins have been found even in Ceres, which means that they circulated and they were used for exchanges and commerce. So I don't have the picture because it has not been published, but I have the description in one, in the one uh, side, there is a full-length figure of the Empress. This is Anna of Savoy, I tell you. And on the other side, two standing Nimbate figures with halo, which I think might be the Anargiri. So she used the Anargiri 
of the convert that she introduced in Thessaloniki. And the other coin I have, of course, thankfully, and this is Anna with the letters of the Paleologan dynasty holding this structure. Usually this structure is the walled city and it might be Thessaloniki. But even Cecil Morrison, the expert on uh, coins, says that this specific structure looks like a specific building. She doesn't know, Cecil Morrison doesn't know anything about the structures in Thessaloniki. She says it might be St. Demetrius. No, it, that is not St. Demetrius. These three, on the western part, three domes of Prophetis Elias correspond to this three dome structure of this coin and the structure that is held by uh, Anna of Savoy. We will never be sure. That's the uh, unhappy part of this uh, talk. Uh, whether this is the Catholicon of Saint Sanargiri, uh, sponsored by Anna of Savoy, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we hope, I hope that at some point there is some inscription or some other uh, detail that will lend more uh, substance to this theory. Uh, like uh, Professor Matsukas, I'm on the verge of writing a novel about all these things, <laughs> like he did for Zilotica, because I think uh, the question of uh, what women did is a fantastic one in the force of uh, uh, rolling the history. So thank you very much for your patience, and uh, I'm open to any questions you might have regarding this uh, theory. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Andrew and Dr. Santis. Um, before we all kick off here, uh, I've just got two of my own questions, whilst maybe you guys cook a few up. Um, if I could just turn to you first, Maria. I, I wondered, um, I heard in Fleeting that the main rebel group in, in this kind of uh, part of the zealots was essentially the dock workers or sailors. And I wondered why that was. Um, is there any special economic or political reason behind them being the kind of instrumental actors here? Founded based on the major um, uh, yeah. Yeah. On, on the major financial divide that, as Professor Francis mentioned, was caused by the growing land ownership uh, in the city. Uh, the sailors, because they were the main uh, working force of, of the city. Uh, and Thessaloniki was a port. Can you hear me? Okay. So I will let's, uh, go back again. Okay. So, uh, as uh, Professor Tantis uh, mentioned, the Zealot movement uh, was built and was based above, uh, uh, upon the great financial uh, division between the growing members of the city and the professional associations. Now, by professional associations, of course, sailors, because Thessaloniki is a port, and uh, uh, as you uh, implied, the top workers uh, were needed all the time. So, in a way, this professional group uh, was there all the time. So, they realized that, uh, of course, their own uh, uh, existence there was threatened. And, of course, their survival and the living, their living standards were threatened. Um, of course, as uh, uh, we all know by the book uh, called the, the Corrupting Sea by Peregrine Horden and uh, Nicholas Parcell, uh, having to do with the sea, has its uh, 
uh, setbacks, but also some uh, some benefits. So for me, sailors were the force for the zealot movement. Let us not also let me also take you back. Also, the sailors were the driving force for the Athenian democracy yeah. because they, they were there, they, they were working yeah. there. Okay, so they, they work, were needed, and yeah, <laughs> excellent. So, uh, this is my answer, but I'm if someone could dig into the zealot movement, and I don't know whether Professor Tantis uh, would like to say more about this, you will find these um, uh, characteristics. Of course, the Republic was short-lived. And let me add that it was fought both by the Byzantine elites and also, whether you believe it or not, also by the Turkish tribes. Because nobody wanted this to, uh, to, to survive for long. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, OK, and okay. um, my question for Dr. Tansis is, um, well, if or when, because I suspect I know the answer, but I'm not really very sure, um, when did Athos start, Mount Athos, that is, start dominating the city of Thessalonica economically? <laughs> Well, there is evidence in uh, the acts of uh, several uh, monasteries in, uh, on Mount Athos that there were uh, properties transferred to the monasteries or uh, bought by the monasteries from the uh, 10th, 11th century. And on the 12th century, actually, there are huge amounts of real estate uh, transferred into the monasteries. So, uh, by the 14th century, the situation must have been very dire for people in Thessaloniki because they had to uh, to lease land from the monasteries and uh, sometimes in uh, huge amounts of well, money. Really early. Yeah. I actually expected your answer to be 13th century. You're saying as early as the 11th. They were quite well, huge uh, well, in, no, no. In 14th century, we have the uh, people complaining about this uh, situation, and it uh, ends up in uh, the zealot movement being against the Athenite monastery as huge landowners inside the city as well. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay, throwing it out to the floor. Have we got any questions? Yeah. Right. So my question was for Dr. Tantis. Um, you spoke about the fact that these um, Capricorns had sort of private balconies for imperial women, or mostly you, we think for imperial women. I wondered if there was evidence that, um, like in you know, Constantinople, the things we know about the Great Palace, that the emperor would enter into his churches, like the Hagia Sophia, um, through a private entrance and wouldn't sort of mix with everybody else as he went to church. I wanted to know um, if there was evidence in the Catholicon of any sort of private entrance or private um, access to the church, to this balcony. And also what precisely would the, the sort of um, liturgies that they were placed, to, so um, allegedly placed themselves above, because I wouldn't imagine that these are churches, especially if you have a VIP balcony for the general public. Uh, well, we know that the emperor used balconies to attend uh, services, not only in uh, Hagia Sophia, but uh, in all the churches that he visited inside Constantinople. And this is uh, described in both the ceremonies, the book about the ceremonies of uh, uh, the imperial palace and uh, where the etiquette for how the emperor is involved. Actually, this letter that I, show, I showed you, just a snippet of it uh, from Athanasius, uh, he, uh, the Patriarch Athanasius actually uh, objects even for the emperor, but he cannot say it directly. So he uses women and he uh, uh, accuses women of all of that. But if you accuse women of putting yourself above the rest of the congregation, you can say the same for the emperor when he uses these 
uh, balconies. And uh, actually, I think that your last question was that there were specific uh, um, ceremonies that took place in balconies like that in, and were, uh, were observed by the emperor. Uh, the emperor, at, uh, in several of the big uh, uh, liturgies in Hagia Sophia, received communion in the balcony. The patriarch uh, had to go all the way up and he uh, administered communion to the emperor there. And there were some uh, um, spaces like um, chambers of the uh, of the emperor where they had breakfast afterward or brunch or something like that. So there are a lot of details concerning these balconies, but I tried to uh, to focus on the balconies in uh, private uh, ecclesiastic uh, institutions, like monasteries uh, founded by women, which uh, this is a specific uh, feature, the balconies. But not only this. Thank you for your presentations. I'm asking two questions out of pure ignorance. Uh, firstly, you mentioned the Bulgarian Empire. Just like to ask how long their influence lasted in Thessaloniki. Um, I didn't sort of follow that entirely. And secondly, what was the relationship between the so-called Bulgarian Empire and the center of Byzantium, the, the Byzantine uh, sphere of influence at Constantinople. The other question I've got to ask is about there seem to be a lot of churches, as you mentioned, in the 14th century Thessaloniki. How were they actually organized? Did, were they each responsible for a specific parish? And was Prophetess Leas? regarded as the main church or not? I'm just asking this question out of ignorance. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think I have put the, um, uh, the beginning and the end of the gallery of the... Is that, yeah, well, Actually, I, I, now I cannot recall it because, because I'm a little bit, you know, overwhelmed by so many uh, information, but it didn't last for long. But however, the relation between the Byzantine and uh, the Bulgars, you cannot say that there is one tenor that uh, characterizes it throughout uh, the decades and uh, uh, the years. Sometimes, for, to give you an example, the Byzantine elite exchanged, for example, brides, Byzantine uh, uh, nobles ma were married into Bulgarian families, and uh, some uh, 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 Bulgarians were host in Thessaloniki. Uh, however, I think it's very um, uh, manifold. Uh, you cannot say that, yes, they were in terms or no, they were just in bed. Uh, history unfolded. Bulgarians, of course, felt that they were a different nation uh, than Byzantines, but in a way they were uh, attracted, they were appealed by the Byzantines. And the Byzantines, in their own way, didn't fought them. They, they, they in a way, uh, had their own way of diplomacy, either to fi fight them, either to wed into their families, they, were, they had their ups and downs. So regarding your second question, um, although for some of the late Byzantine churches of Thessaloniki we don't know much, uh, we have this notion, and if you follow the bibliography, you'll see that they are all treated as uh, monastic churches. None of the 14th century churches is... Uh, a, a parish church or a common church, and that is why Prophetess Elias, through its uh, 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 scale, uh, seems to be much bigger than the rest and much more important. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I've got a question for Henry, I think, yes. just uh, in relation to Godwin. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, <laughs> he seemed a little early to be English, but I'm guessing possibly a Germanic of some sort. Yeah. And in light of that, I'm just wondering, is, is that the earliest that you see an appearance of a, of a name of that kind, uh, and, and are there others? Yes. Um, I was genuinely shocked to come across his name. I've actually, to be honest, read Villa. <laughs> Theophilact before uh, this chap's Theophilact uh, Simakata, and he's um, a really useful source. You don't get that many super useful sources, so it's a bit embarrassing for me to only uh, really flag him up very recently, literally yesterday. Um, and I think you know there are a few guys who uh, turn up in Imperial service, shall we say, who come from um, provincial standing. Sometimes you get the peripheries of the, of the empire. I'm actually thinking, funnily enough, the Lombards were pretty uh, sneaky buggers in the sense that they went from fighting for Rome in Persia um, to basically being rebels in Italy. Uh, and so a lot of them got fairly senior up, you know, the military staff um, before they turned turncoats and became dukes in their own right in Italy. Um, but yes, I think what genuinely surprised me is I haven't seen any, if I'm honest, but many certainly Saxon names coming up. I've seen Gothic. Uh, I've not seen Saxon. Uh, and I think that's what got me. Uh, it's, a, it's a super, super find. Uh, I got slapped down slightly on Twitter when I mentioned him because a different historian said he, got a, he was a senior. He actually, they claimed that he was senior. Um, a senior military officer, as in he was just below a general, when I described him as junior. Um, but I mean, that's just uh, historical politics, really. But yeah, it's fascinating. The one thing I just add to the Bulgarian question, actually, is that my favorite, just to add a bit of drama, um, basically that people always say the Bulgars and uh, Byzantines were at loggerheads, but one of my favorite episodes was, I think the first Latin emperor of Constantinople um, I think his name is Baldwin, was actually essentially flung off a precipice at Veliko Tarnovo by the Bulgars uh, on the command of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Byzantine, many empires plural at that point, sadly. Uh, but yeah, anyway. any other questions? Oh, yeah, we'll chat over there. Then I have a question. Oh, you got a question for me as well, right, okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, I think this one's probably for Professor Zanthu. The slides we saw before the talk, you, um, you were showing the east of the city and the circus, and outside that some triangular projecting bastions. I know there are similar ones on the western side of the city because last time I visited, that was right where my hotel was. But I've never seen anything similar in, in Roman or Byzantine fortification anywhere else. Do you know if those uh, triangular bastions are unique to Thessalonica or do you know of any other examples? Well, although I'm not uh, an expert in uh, architecture, I know there are some, uh, uh, perhaps uh, Professor Tadis, who is an architect, might know better about the Byzantine walls. I, I can refer you to two monographs. The one is by George Hunaris, the Byzantine walls of Thessalonica. And uh, Velen. and Velenis also uh, George Veleni George both Georges George Woolens and George Velenis who wrote about the Byzantine world. So I would like to to uh, refer to Professor Tatsi because he knows Byzantine worlds better. Uh, no, and so, uh, the only thing I can offer is that uh, you are right for asking this because they are unique, the triangular, but they are. In the eastern part of the walls, there are very few. They are much more in the western part, and actually they are the ones that have, you know, what is considered to be uh, the marble seating of the hippodrome on their lower part, if you remember this uh, detail. They have the marble parts in their base, and this is considered to be uh, the seating of the hippodrome. And this is a huge question about Thessaloniki because uh, we tend to think that the eastern and western walls were constructed in the same period, 
which I think is a huge mistake, but don't worry about that. Because if they used the sitting of the hippodrome, why carry it all the way to the western part and not, and not use it in the eastern part if it has to do with the Theodosius massacre and the seize of uh, uh, chariot racing in the hippodrome and all this question, which is, you know, it's huge for Thessaloniki. So you might want to, but it is in Greek. I don't know, you read Greek. Oh, no, yeah. Unfortunately, the bibliography is mostly in Greek, so it won't help you a lot, I'm sorry. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that, indeed, the uh, Thessalonica, well, if you just browse the bibliography about Thessalonica, you will see that there are many monographs, unfortunately, written most in uh, usually British researchers tend, uh, tend to focus either in Istanbul, in Rome, uh, in um, uh, what's uh, uh, the other, um, uh, the church, that, uh, Ravenna, oh, Ravenna. Uh, Ravenna and so on. So Thessaloniki, and uh, since I taught in uh, in the UK universities, I uh, so far in, in modern British scholarship, I haven't met anyone focusing on Thessalonica and especially either on architecture or on story. And believe me, uh, Thessal Thessaloniki, whether you believe it or not, is very closely related to British history in many, many ways. So <laughs> that was my concluding <laughs> part. <laughs> it's this cruel epitaph, but it's true. Yes. Uh, just one more, I think. I've got it. it was mentioned that the uh, Venetians were given for a period of time the role of administrating the city. What was the story kind of behind that? Why did that end up? Yes, well, they they thought the Byzantines thought that first of all the Venetians uh, would fight for the city because they they needed a port in North Aegean. Unfortunately, this proved to be a miscalculation because the Venetians didn't. I mean, if they needed this port, they would they would have fought for it. For example, they, they would have supported the, the city walls. They would do some fortification works, which, okay, some they did, but they didn't do enough. So the Venetians were focused in other parts of the world, and so they didn't want to fight for Thessaloniki as much as, for uh, example, other uh, places and other ports. All, uh, and they might uh, also thought that uh, this uh, battle is, uh, is lost and uh, maybe they could also make uh, later on some kind of, um, uh, of pact with the Ottomans in the long run, okay, not uh, when the city was conquered. But definitely the Venetians, uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, it, Thessaloniki was given to the Venetians, was in place for, for, uh, to the Venetians in order to be fortified and to be supported and to be defended as a port. But the Venetians were uh, engaged with, with uh, they, they were not in their A list. They liked trade and, and the GN Empire, but they didn't like overheads. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but if I may, yes. I'm sorry now to interrupt, but uh, if I may, it's the same situation in the Peloponnese. The Byzantines in the Peloponnese tried to persuade the Venetians to help with defending the Peloponnese against the Turks, but uh, the Venetians were happy just to have Methoni and uh, Monevasia and a little bit of uh, Corinth. They didn't want to have the whole. Uh, area to themselves so uh, as long as the ottomans didn't interfere with these outposts they didn't care the whole situation got uh, yeah but the the byzantines thought you know that the uh, venice would help them they didn't so that was the miscalculation exactly and also uh, the venetians who, who would probably interested as uh, professor dance mentioned in the trade in the main mediterranean the, the route for example between sicily malta uh, kithera uh, cyprus and uh, uh, of course istanbul but thessaloniki in a way was used as a bottleneck 
if we uh, also judge from uh, the recent history, either f f uh, as a bottleneck against Slavs to, to come uh, southwards, or in, in, in order to connect the, the hinterland of the Balkans with the sea. Yeah. Very good note to end on. <laughs> Which in a way uh, also um, is a fact also for today. <laughs> the wine reception will follow at the back of the room, so I think we can continue the conversation and Q&A uh, back then. Uh, so please join me in a big round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> so thank you very much for this wonderful evening. I would also like to thank our sponsors, the AG Leventis Foundation, the Hellenic TV for covering uh, the event, and of course, live media for streaming the event uh, for our online audience. Uh, thank you for attending. Please enjoy the drinks and canapes. Thank you very much. <laughs>